Well, welcome everybody to another Women Lead uh, forum in our series of online forums that are put together specifically for women uh, to, to help us learn how to be better leaders, um, better business women, you know, just better all around. Um, so I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat who was actually willing to say, yeah, go ahead and ask me anything. And our session today lasts for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guest and our attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. This is a conversation, not an interview. So if you have something you want to say, just feel free to say it. If it's something you want to ask anonymously, just put it in the chat and I would be happy to, to ask it for you. And our topic today is Awake, Assess, Adapt. And I'm really excited to introduce today's subject matter expert, Sheila Nettie. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Sheila is a wealth empowerment coach with Nettie Wealth wealth coaching. Sheila's passion is in helping professional women who are anxious and worried about money, struggling to get to their next income goal, want to end money challenges, afford enriching experiences, and create a robust retirement. She's been where you are and knows how it feels to think, I really should know something about how I should manage my money. So without any further ado, I'm so happy to introduce Sheila to you. Sheila, go ahead and say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and happy to see your beautiful faces. And uh, um, yeah, I'm excited to be here, open to all the questions that you might have. Um, don't uh, shy away from anything around money. Um, I've been definitely, as, as Patty said, where you may have been or you may be at this moment, where I really struggled with money and really wasn't sure if I was gonna make retirement, but I did hit my retirement goal at 55. And so I've learned a few things along the way about how to do that from my own investments. That wasn't a pension. So I just wanted to say that to make sure you kind of see that it's a lot of, um, it can be done. Is the way I wanna put it. So. Yeah. Well, that's I encouraging, especially, you know, some of us, um, have maybe had experiences along the years where things didn't quite go like we thought they were going to go. You know, the the job you thought was going to last forever didn't last. The marriage you thought was going to last forever didn't last. You know, different financial ups and downs. And so it's nice to know that it's recoverable, that there's a way that you can recover and get back on your feet. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So what are you seeing now? Like what kinds of, I loved the title that you suggested. So where did that come from? Are people like suddenly going, whoa, wait a minute, maybe I should get serious about this thing, you know? Well, as we all know, the pandemic kind of shifted things for a lot of people. A lot of people yeah. ended up with, you know, their businesses where they had lots of business all of a sudden come to a halt and they had no business coming in. And one of the things that I found as I was working with some of my clients who also had businesses that shut down was that they were not, um, they were not aware of their money habits that may be contributing to some of their stress level. Yeah. And that's kind of the first thing I take my clients through initially when they start working with me is figuring out what are your money habits, what are your beliefs, and what are your behaviors? Because that's the that's the thing that's running everything in the background that they may not be completely aware of. Mm -hmm. And so it is so critical to know what are your beliefs, what are your behaviors, and what are you doing with your money? Because one of the things I really have people look at is what are your expenses? What's been going on? Do you realize they may have things coming, come, coming out that you didn't even realize you still had you know, going on? And so kind of becoming awake to what you currently are doing with your money is really the key. Um, and then assess was to say, okay, now that I'm awake, now that I see what I may be doing that's not really uh, moving me toward my priorities or where I'd like to go, what do I do about it? You know, where am I? What's the current state of my money? What are my numbers? Which yes. is the way I describe really understanding where your, your expenses, what are your income, really seeing where you are from your savings, uh, were you one of those people who actually had an emergency fund and so that you could kind of write out some of this with it? Um, years ago, when I started a, another business, I made a point of having five years 
I may not be like most people, but I had five years to handle my expenses to make sure that I could stay afloat. And so um, one of the things that you kind of need to do is look at where are you now, assess where you are. And again, no, no shame, no, you know, we tend to beat ourselves up about this stuff and we don't need to beat ourselves up. It is what it is, right? The past is the past. We can't fix it. We can't change it. But if we try to kind of, you know, put our heads in the sand, then we can't fix it. And so, um, and so really a big thing I really uh, like people to think about is be compassionate yourself, be your own best friend mm -hmm. as you go through this kind of assessment mm -hmm. and then adapt. Now that we're under this new environment, what's going on? Um, how do I shift? How do I change? What do I need to put in place that will help me navigate these new waters and also come out even better on the other side? Yeah. Excellent. That's excellent. I, I liked what you said about our beliefs. What are some of the beliefs that, that you find women have about money? Well, a lot of times, because we weren't taught about money in school, um, a lot of women particularly are, oh, let the man handle that. Let the guy in your life, or you don't, you don't, you don't have a brain for numbers, you know, let, and on, that always irritates me to no end. Um, but, uh, but unfortunately- Girls aren't good at math, right? Yeah. yeah, being a physics degree person, I have a physics degree, that's always irritated me to no end. You know, it's just ugh, frustrating. But anyway, the, you know, being told you don't know numbers, you can't, you know, that's not accurate. We were never taught about finances. We were never taught how to manage our money, how to grow it how to, you know, in a sense, invest it. How do we move through some of the things that we may, you know, all those, those beliefs that we have, which is a lot of times, you know, um, uh, one that I find a lot is also that, you know, rich people are greedy. Well, you're not gonna become a wealthy person if you believe that because you don't wanna be greedy. So you're not going to, or rich people are, you know, a lot of them are bad or they just spend money and they don't really care about people. If you have beliefs like that, they're kind of underlying. And a lot of times it was parents who just talked about something, but we took it in. And yeah. so the, um, as children, and so basically it's kind of running in the background, mm -hmm. you will stop yourself. Like mm -hmm. you will stop yourself from actually reaching your goals if you have those kind of beliefs running in the background. And so we have to uncover that in order to really heal it in a sense and shift it to ones that will support your real goals, where you really want to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Sheila, you mentioned something like we weren't taught, taught about investing. And, and that's very true um, because I, I, I teach my, nep my nieces about investment now. But when I was coming up, we didn't have money to invest. You know, there, when somebody mentioned investment, I mean, that was the last thing you thought about because you don't really have extra money to invest. So, but one of the things I've learned, of course, over the years is that the first thing you do is to invest in yourself. That is not what you learn when you are struggling, you know, trying to raise a child or what, however you, you grew up, you know, that, that is not something you learn. You just learn that you have only enough money to do what you need to do and invest in yourself will come later, <laughs> you know? So, um, so I think that's really important. I mean, it's certainly important to me now because there have been times in my life that I've gotten to a, a point and then I feel like I'm starting all over again for, for whatever the reason, like you said, you know, get divorced or, or this or that. And right now with COVID, I feel like I'm back in my twenties struggling, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think it's, it's really important that, um, you know, that everybody learn that. I think you bring up a good point about investing in yourself, right? It's just not something um, that we're told about, you know, early on. Um, and I think that's so critical and investing yourself can be something as simple as reading, you know, and if you don't have the money, getting in the knowledge, which again, if you've been, you know, if in the past, I mean, my parents did as much as I could, but they really were, you know, struggling with money. They, you know, we, we did okay. My father was trying, he had two yeah. he had business and he worked a job. So I can't say he didn't have the entre entrepreneurial spirit in there, but okay. it, still was something that, again, you're kind of like, you're not taught it in school, which for me is the major, major issue. I really feel like that's something that I've been on the, on the, a movement to try and change that, to be honest, um, because it is important that we, you know, understand so many basics, because even as we're starting out, we could be starting out on the right foot. 
um, where we're starting to save even $10, even $15, even, just start saving. So we get into the habit of knowing that we pay ourselves first, that we take care, you know, we put this aside for us first. And even that can help us when things do get harder or things get to be a struggle. We've, we've kind of embedded that habit of taking care of ourselves and making sure that we pay ourselves first, that will eventually get us to at that point where we can invest, where we can put money away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, you know, what I have found too is that, and generally speaking, women are not risk takers. Mm -hmm. Men tend to be more risk takers and women generally don't. I'm going to share something very briefly with you, which is ironic because it's the opposite of what the typical thing is. <laughs> I'm from Jamaica, right? Both my parents worked. My father was a, an accountant, CPA. My mother was an executive secretary. Traditionally, every, they were paid once a month. Every month, my father gave his check to my mother. She was the one who spent the money in, and saved the money. It's a, a, incredible. Here's a man who's an accountant, right? <laughs> and he doesn't manage the money. He gives the check to my mother. And she, in turn, then decides about the groceries, what needs to be paid, what the bills need to be paid. And, and she was the one who was managing to, un, the money. Unfortunately, my mother passed away when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, being that I was 14, my father then had to take up the responsibility of managing his own money. Yet he did a good job at managing other people's money. And he did a good job managing eventually, of course, because he had to, right? But what an ironic thing that here's a family with a father who's an accountant, turns over the responsibility, doesn't want it, to a, a woman that's really not a financial person. And then he has to take it back, of course, you know? It, and it's just a shift. But I'm saying that to say, because in this, all of this has to do with the environmental, and we just shared some of that. It's like, I think for me, I benefited from it. And the reason why I'm saying that is because being the only girl and the eldest with four younger brothers, I was able to help learn some of what my mother did to help to contribute for the future, to help my brothers through college, whatever, whatever, in managing that money and managing my own finances to help my, my younger siblings, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I, it, it's, it's so ironic. Usually we, women don't do that. You know, because we our role is so different. And I grew up in the in the in I'm in the fifties. I'm in you know fifties. I'm a baby boomer. So it's like wow, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's awesome. it's funny because I my mother also managed the money, and that's probably why I do what I do. Um, yeah. Was she managed the money? My father gave her the money, and mm -hmm. <laughs> and take care of everything. And so, um, and I am the oldest. Uh, and I have three young, yep. young brothers. <laughs> ah, what a story. Oh my God. <laughs> it's the same carbon copy kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not a friend exactly. of the person. I think yeah. that's funny. But it's interesting how I think that dynamic changes things, doesn't it? It shifts it for us that, yes, women can be in control of money because we saw an example of it when we were young, you know, watching our mothers be able to manage the money and take care of everything. And so we kind of took that on like that's normal. Mm -hmm. You know, and that same thing happened in my marriage. I take care of all the money. I manage it, invest it. I take care of everything. I've always have. Um, and so uh, to me, this is normal. But I know that that's not normal for most people. <laughs> but, but also, uh, you know, there's so many, well, women that I know that don't know enough about their finances. I've had to take care of my finances all my life because I've been single. I mean, been married, but single most of my life, you know, where I had, I really had to to do it myself, but there are so many women who just rely on somebody else to do it. And then something happens, they have no idea whether it's just, you know, how to go to the bank, how to do, you know, about accounts or anything. And those are the ladies that I, I sometimes wonder, how are they going to, how are they going to get through life? Mm -hmm. You know, because now they have to, re they have to learn everything. I mean, everything. I'm talking about people who just don't, have any clue at all and i don't even know how you get to your 40s and you don't know that mm -hmm. but there are a lot that do mm -hmm. yeah there may be um you know we have people who 
uh, I, I'm trying to remember a story that's coming up to me. I remember someone sharing with me who was actually a divorce um, financial planner. She actually focuses on that. Um, and so was sharing me a story about a woman who was getting a divorce. She had no idea how much money her, her husband had. She had no idea about the assets. She had no idea um, about any of the money because he'd been doing it the whole time they'd been married. And so she basically was almost going to end up on the street mm -hmm. divorce yes. because she had, because he was hiding the money. He was hiding how much he had. And so it brings back the critical, it is so critical. And I think that's why I, I that is why I focus on women primarily mm -hmm. is because of the fact that this is so critical to our uh, money, even though obviously it's not everything, but it is so important for us to focus on it because it is the foundation that we need in order to survive in this world, mm -hmm. right? So you really have to look at it at, as something that because it is foundational, you have to have the knowledge to be able to handle it as well as what's going on in your marriage like you know like where is money where are the accounts how many do we have that um and i think it comes back to when we were talking about earlier about the fact that women oh you don't need to know about that you know you don't need to know <laughs> um somebody else will take care of that or you you don't have a mind for that and that is obviously so not true mm -hmm. um but the the real i want to say the underlying goal that i have is to really change on a generational level by focusing on women and helping them learn as much as they can about money and how to grow and how to invest it then they can show their children mm -hmm. because i really encourage all my clients to teach their children to teach right. other people about how to do this so we can spread this so we can have financial literacy that is everywhere and everybody has a basic understanding of it so that we're all playing with the you know uh i don't want to say with the big boys if you will but being able to manage, grow, because there's wealth available for everybody. It is there. We, but if you don't know how to get to it or how to build it, then you can't, you're not going to have it. Mm -hmm. That is, unfortunately, it is that sad and simple. And I think we're living in an age of uncertainty and it behooves us all to take responsibility for quote unquote our assets and make sure we manage those, especially of course money, Make sure we manage that effectively for these future days that we don't even know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uncertainty is, is, is so in our face that mm -hmm. it's, and, and these millennials and these other younger folks really need to recognize that it really is about putting aside a, a dollar for, t for, for the next day, for tomorrow. Right? Don't live all of it today. It's good to be in the present and live for today, but what about tomorrow? You yeah. know? It does happen. We need to know that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty scary right now. Yeah, I think they're living it right now. You know, I think they're living it right now. But the safety net is so critical. And that's one of the things, too, that I really push people to have at least whatever. I mean, I figure you, you definitely have to have three months. I feel you have to have a year, but that's me. Um, because I feel like that you just don't know. And this way you are prepared. Like if something happens, let's say you, if we weren't dealing with a pandemic, it could be, in a sense, we're all business people. What, you know, in a sense, what happens in the business goes down? Um, or if you're working in a career in corporate, the corporate, you know, the corporation decides that, well, we need to cut costs and we need to eliminate your position. What do you do? If you have the safety net set aside, then, okay, you just roll with it. You know, you know, you'll be able to move into another position. You've got your expenses handled and you can then look for the opportunities that will allow you to go to probably even a better place than you were then. But if you don't have that kind of I want to call it your survival kind of taken care of so that you can focus on those opportunities that appear because really there will be opportunities for you know as a anytime you go into a recession recession makes millionaires makes they do and so as things start to come real estate kind of stays kind of stable but the stock market drops and they're usually not in unison which is kind of nice but right now some people need to look at what can they be doing on a lot of levels on uh, reducing their expenses, one of which is refinancing, you know, the mortgages since the interest rates are so low. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things that I'm talking to people about as well as looking at that, looking at, um, you know, obviously right now the stock market's a little, in my opinion, a little weird. Um, mm -hmm. And so it it's, doesn't make sense right now. It makes no sense at all. It's not following anything. Um, and so we kind of have to say, okay, that reception probably coming 
we don't, of course, we never say when, but then you have to watch that. You have to say, okay, when it hits, then you, you get in when everybody's getting out. Meaning you yeah. come in as things drop and it's so low and you get in because then um, that's when you can make the most money. And as I say, that is when a millionaire is made when the recessions hit after yeah. they've hit, of course. Where is that crystal ball, you know, that, <laughs> that says buy Amazon or buy Zoom. I wish I bought Zoom, you know. <laughs> I wish I really. Oh, wow. We wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be on some private beach. <laughs> I know, it would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. Sheila, I have a question for you. Uh, in reference to, you mentioned real estate, and that's one of the areas of interest. So the interest rate is low now, and it's my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know, I mean, I know some about real estate, but of course, I'm sure your exposure is much more than I, mine. So the interest rate is low. So is this the prices of real estate remain the same or grow? Will it, you, do you, and my question is, in light of the fact that the interest rate is low, do you see real estate prices stabilizing or growing, but not my, not decreasing, the value not decreasing? Do you see it st stabilizing? Okay. Good question. Increasing. Okay, so when something like this hits where you have people, that depends on where you are and location, location, location. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the, it's a good time to get a deal, in my opinion, on mm -hmm. real estate if someone is, in a position where they need to get out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And though, and so if the location, if you've done your homework and you know that the location is a good location and will more than likely appreciate one thing stabilized, then mm -hmm. it's a good buy, right? Now, there are neighborhoods where unfortunately, where you, you will have a drop when mm -hmm. it's happening because that neighborhood may have more people who are in corporate or more people who are, right. um, who had, you know, um, jobs, they lost their jobs. So therefore that value may drop in those neighborhoods. But as I say, overall with the interest rates being low, it's a good time, you can get a deal. Like for instance, my grandson who was planning on buying a home, been trying in San Diego, been trying and trying, was able to finally get a home. Great. Right? So at a good value in a good neighborhood um, at a good interest rate. So, um, so that's what I mean by the opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. If you've done your homework or you do your homework and make sure that the location is a good location and, um, and that you can, cause you can always look at what have been the values in that area and then, um, and see where it is now and see if you can get a deal because it is possible. So my question, just to wrap up this piece, my interest is selling rather than this is a little future thing I have planned here for next year. So the thing is, people are going to be selling property because they may be losing their job. They may not have the, whatever and they have to get out. But my area also of interest is selling property at the current or higher value because the interest rate is low. See, the balance in yeah, and balance. I guess what I'm trying to figure out, and I've got to talk to a couple of relatives too, um, is, is it does it look like it's going to hold for a while? I don't want to lose my property, lose, lose the value of what I can make on it because it's a, it's a fiscal question, you know, in reference to how much equity I can get or how much. I get your, I get your question. Yeah. So yeah. all I can say is, in, I can only study, I only study San Diego. So I can Got only here. I'm so in LA. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. LA so, is good. Where I am. Good. It has not really, except in certain areas. It really hasn't. And it's usually on a one by one basis. So the fact that yeah. my grandson got in was just because he happened to talk to the right person. He lowballed it and he was Great. able to, oh, right, wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. That's why he was able to get that deal. But right now, real estate in, in, in uh, San Diego is pretty much holding. It's not, mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, so for now it's holding. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so we, you know, we shall see, but, um, but I don't, I don't, my opinion, I don't see it dropping. Um, I don't either. Yeah. Um, I don't see it dropping. <laughs> that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, so that's my opinion. So <laughs> um, I, don't see it, I don't see it dropping. I don't see a reason, right? Okay. Because when you think about it, even with, um, when you look at what's going on now where everybody's got the rentals and they can't, you know, they can't evict anybody. Um, once that, lifts, which it will eventually, um, mm -hmm. that will shift 
that will shift things. Yep. And and so um, so, but until then, or until we see what that does, mm -hmm. you know. But for now, everything is pretty much holding from what I see. Mm -hmm. You know, my experience with with what I saw of my parents was different than um, than yours, Liz, and and yours, um, Sheila. My mom was a stay at home mom. Um, my dad was the breadwinner, and she had no idea what kind of money we had, if we had money. She, you know, she had no idea, and and she was actually quite proud of that. I mean, she would sort of say, "Well, he makes the money, and I spend the money." You know, like that was really funny. You know, kind of. She's a bit of a Southern belle, you know, and, and I saw that and, and thought, well, that doesn't seem very fair. You know, it sure seemed like he worked awfully hard for them to always be fighting about money, you know, or worried about money. And so in my first marriage, um, at first he was like, yes, this is my job. This is the man's job, you know, well, he, he was an idiot you know, and he didn't know how to manage money. And he had that pay yourself first thing down pat because he would always pay himself first by going and buying himself toys and buying things, you know, and he didn't, and I would find bills that hadn't been paid and things like that. So finally, you know, took it over, took it away and said, no, this is what, you know, this is what we're going to do. And, and I, I got to be really, really good at taking a teeny weeny bit and making it just straight match, you know, and scream. Wow. And then when, when our marriage broke up, I was back, you know, like Kay said, man, right back in it again. You know, at, at 42, I was suddenly back to no money, um, you know, or a money. I mean, but it was a definitely reduced, you know, income. I was living off my income, having to raise yeah. my kids. And it, I was right back in that, how many ways can you stretch a dollar, you know, until it screams. <laughs> and it really taught me, I was so glad that I'd, you know, that I've had the experience because I wasn't trying to learn on the fly, you know, like, like you said, Sheila, you know, divorce lawyers saying these women don't even know how much money they have or where the money is. I knew everything and uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. There was more bad and ugly than there was good, you know, <laughs> but I, I would try to tell my daughter that, you know, is that you need to, you need to know, you know, you need to be aware of what's going on and, and be kind of you know, it's one thing to partner with somebody, but it's a whole other thing to just abdicate your responsibility and be in the dark, you know? Yeah, I think it's a good thing for you that you were able to translate that and now pass it on to your daughter, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be in that. Because I think that's, that's the key, right? We, we, we want to learn the lessons. We don't want the lesson necessarily, per se, but, you know, yeah. you get them. And in a sense, it then helps you make sure that she's going to be in a better space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as she moves out and you know moves on and i think that um unfortunately yeah we've got that situation where some women just decide they're going to just they don't need that they don't need to deal with all that but it's so imperative that you have a partnership i think that was the key word i heard you say it's so yeah. it's yeah. so nice if you have that because both of you can be making these critical decisions along the way together mm -hmm. um and um, that would be ideal because it's always two heads are better than one. You know, you're going to come up with different, um, uh, different ideas, and also you can also have maybe different money stuff. You know, yeah. when it comes to those beliefs and and um, and those behaviors, so that you can kind of balance each other out or help the you know help one kind of work through some of that, and the other one help the other one by mm -hmm. seeing the different behaviors. Yeah. And so I think that that's always um, that would be ideal and be wonderful. Mm -hmm. you know? way everybody had it yeah, yeah definitely I really wanted my husband to just handle all the finances <laughs> because the man has an engineering degree and an MBA mm. and I'm like, great you know and, <laughs> and I'm liberal arts all the way as little math as possible etc but early on in our marriage I discovered that he just wasn't doing a very good job and I I was taught by my grandfather never to carry debt. I mean, other than maybe a mortgage, maybe a car payment, but you know, mm -hmm. carry debt. And so I ended up taking it all away from my husband and managing it myself. And both of us have credit scores of around 800 mm -hmm. and must be doing something right. But, yeah. you know, I, I just, I don't like numbers. I don't like math. I, <laughs> Engineer, MBA, 
You did a good job. <laughs> well, that's that's why you hire someone like Sheila. She'll do it. Yeah. Well, so I, I, you know, it, it was it was one of those, you know, uh, almost divorced over because what are you doing with our finances? Why do we have balances on our credit cards? What you know? Why are you spending all this money? And so, uh, yeah, yeah, I ended up taking it over. But um, I, you know, I don't think I taught my children much of anything, but my 25 year old um, contributes to a 401k at her job and also doesn't like to carry a balance. She gets very anxious about, you know, carrying balances. And she also gets very anxious if she doesn't have at least a couple of months emergency funds. So I'm, you know, I'm so impressed by that. I'm like, what? Who taught you that? <laughs> she got it from you. She definitely got it from you. It's amazing. What, that's what I, I found too, that kids pick up on the parents. And you may not be knowing, you, you don't know when they're picking up. You don't know which conversation they heard that was the key and the trigger that got her to hear that. She, doesn't, she saw your behaviors and that's what she took in. And so that's really, and that's awesome because that's, she, she picked that up. Mm. Like I said, wow. I'm really proud of her for those things, you know. Fortunately, I screwed her up in other ways. So, you know, <laughs> not a total failure as a mother. <laughs> oh, that, that's super, Amy, because I'm like, you. I hate numbers, but I have a business, so I got to figure it out, you know. I mean, I, I really hate it, and I wish that I could be in a position to afford someone. Besides, you know, I mean, I have an accountant because at the end of the year, yeah. I don't know what the hell to do, you know. <laughs> But, you know, but on, during the year, I have to figure it out myself. And um, it, it's not fun and it, it's not really easy to me. I remember when my, my son was coming up and fortunately I knew a little bit more than him, but, <laughs> but when he was working, he had a 401k. I asked him if he had a 401k and he said, mom, I don't know. I, what is, what's a 401k, right? So I asked him to send me the paperwork from his job. And when I saw that he had a 401k, I tried to talk to him, but you know, he was not hearing any of it. So what I did during that time, I could do it. I signed him up for the 401k. And when he got his check, you know, he, he called me and he said, mom, I'm missing some money here and I'm, I'm not sure what to do about it, you know? And that's when I told him, I said, look, you get paid four times a month, $10 out of those checks are not gonna make any difference to you. And I had to really convince him of that, you know, because he was really ready to stop it. Mm -hmm. and he stayed there for a long time. By the time he left, he had $27,000. So, mm -hmm. you know, he did thank me. Now that's probably one time in life he thanked me. But <laughs> well, Probably by the time he left, he was at that age where he realizes that, you know, you, you, you do know a few things. I hope so. But, you know, to, to date, I don't know. I, I mean, I, rem I remember him saying thank you because he did buy a house, you know. Wow. And, you know, he had, when he got married, he did buy a house. But today, I'm not sure he would give me credit for that. <laughs> I got to jump off for a second, but I'll be back. Well, I'd love to know, okay, why, do you think, why do you think numbers aren't fun? Like, why do you feel like you just feel like numbers are just, like, not Oh, fun? my God. I just, I, I can't get it right. I mean, I, I could, you know, the simplest math should be so easy and it could take me hours to do something. I just do not like numbers. I never have. Math and statistics were the courses that I begged for a D in, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just honestly, they just don't resonate with me. Now you ask me anything else, literature, anything else, you know, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But you know, the math, I'm, I'm just not, you know, you have to figure out what you're good at. And, and that is not something that I'm good at. You know, so I'd rather, I'd rather spend the time to, to try to figure it out, but the really, I'd really rather pay somebody to figure it out. But on the other hand, it's my money. I can't really do that. I don't really want to do that. So I have to figure it out. And I'm sure that over the years, I haven't done it properly and I've probably lost money along the way, you know, I mean, I don't want to think that, but I, I just know that because my hatefulness with, with uh, math probably at some point might have cost me, you know? 
Well, I think the key is that's where a, a somebody, a financial advice, somebody can actually, if you have someone, and I'm speaking for Sheila, she can speak for herself, I'm sure. Uh, you know, if you have someone that you can have a conversation with and that can coach you and help you to say, okay, how much do you, how much do you bring in? What are your expect? I can tell you something about these financial advisors. They been there. <laughs> they are something else. They want you to write down all your expect. That's the part I hate because then I I have to be. I have to be responsible for where your first conversation had to do with where are you spending your money? What are you doing with your money? And that's when these financial advisors and I do have a very good one. I should say I'm very blessed too. Um, really hold you to the fire, your feet to the fire and say, okay, you're making this money. Where is it? Where you tell me what you've been doing with it, which is something that it sounds like that would be very good for you to have, Kay, because you'll be held to accountability, right? Not, not just your own accountability, but somebody else's. I just want yeah, to share. I'm, I'm sort of doing that now with my accountant because, you know, I, I mean, when she first took over, I had I had money everywhere, you know, and accounts that they shouldn't have been in and you know, yeah. all of that, you know. So I am, so she's taught me a lot and I've, I've learned a lot. I do have a financial advisor because when I retired from the county, I had to figure out what I was going to do with mm -hmm. that 401k and I didn't want to leave it with the county. So I, I do have, I do have that. Of course, now it's gone down so much. It's just pathetic almost, you know, but um, so I, I, I'm better. I'm better. I still don't like numbers but I'm better at it than I was, so. Kay, to me, that sounds like a mindset conversation. Yeah. And I know that's what Sheila touched on. Yeah. And it's really interesting hearing you talk because you're really an example, I think, of what Sheila uh, was talking about when she started the conversation. And I'm listening to your words and it's, um, it's like you're convincing yourself that you're, you, know, you don't like it. <laughs> Well, I don't. <laughs> That's funny I, feel the same. I, I feel the same. I feel the same. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, um, it's not. I have to admit, numbers are my strong suit. So I, but I, but I do understand. And there are ways to work through that mindset to make it simpler. One of the things I take my clients through, because a lot of them don't want to deal with numbers. That's why they came to me, right? right. They, they really were struggling. Um, and a lot of it's a struggle just because they just didn't know where they were. They just didn't understand where they were. Um, and, uh, and so part of that was working through their beliefs and their mindset around money, around tracking the money, yeah. right? Managing the expenses. And then as we do that, then they were able to shift. So one of the things that I get them to do is really create what I call affirmations on steroids, um, which are basically shifting their whole thought process. So before we get into the numbers, before we even start trying to use any kind of software or anything to track the numbers and create what I call a spending plan versus a budget. I actually prefer that term. Um, and uh, because that sounds a lot more fun than budget. And, uh, and so what we do is we work through that affirmation that works for them, whatever their particular issue. And I say it's on steroids because it's not just an affirmation, it's actually a visualization. So it basically oh. shifts their whole thoughts. They actually take themselves in a way in a, into to a place in their own voice so that they then hear this over and over because you definitely believe yourself. You believe your own voice. So by putting in their voice, having it auto so that they listen to it every day, they start to shift. So when we get into the numbers, it's actually easier. They all tell me this. It's actually easier because they've been listening to this for a good couple of weeks before we actually get into the numbers. And so it actually is much simpler for them. And then by the end of it, they're actually happy. They're like, oh, this wasn't so hard. <laughs> this wasn't so, this is actually easier than I thought because we've been changing their whole thought process around it. And yeah, that goes and, back to what you said at the beginning, that those are the, that's the story running behind the scenes. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's funny because I was, I was never very good at math in school and I, and I built that narrative up in my head. Oh, I'm not, oh gosh, I got to take another math class. I'm not any good at math <laughs> until I took algebra because I was an English major, you know, and I was like, when I had to take algebra in high school, it wasn't numbers, it was letters. And there was just that silly little, you know, uh, change in the mindset that 
I aced that class. It was, I was brilliant at algebra. Unfortunately, you can't do everything with algebra. And then when I was in my graduate program in my statistics class, I was like, I mean, I was terrified of it. And I did so well in that class, but it was, it was a matter of learning the formulas, learning the letters, learning that, that kind of thing. And at the end of the, the second, it was a, two semester course and at the end of the second semester my professor said so you're going to continue in this right because you're so good at it and I was like oh hell no. <laughs> no 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 I said I learned it to take the test and then I immediately forgot it but it it made statistics made more sense to me than just regular old math just like algebra made more sense because it was letters instead so I think it's a it, it's a weird mind trick you do with yourself you know to talk I never got to that point <laughs> Well, I, I like what you're saying though, Patty. I feel like it's some part of the application of it too, right? Because just learning math, uh, just to learn math feels, you know, it, it can feel frustrating and, you know, you get up into upper level calculus and you're, it's so nebulous, right? And yeah. you start to learn things and put them to models that don't make sense. Right. But I've loved, and, and Sheila, I don't know how you feel about that, but kind of taking the basic understanding and then plugging it into like QuickBooks or into, you know, the software where it's like, oh, it's kind of a game. Like how many more numbers can I find? And I mean, I think gamification is a way around like just the straight columns of numbers and checking it over. But I do love some of the new software interfaces. And I don't know, Sheila, if you, when you get to that point with people, if that's what you have them migrate to or they're doing more I take them away from I, I agree with you it's much more fun you know when you put it in a software it makes it much simpler so we're not using excel or anything else mm -hmm. we use software programs um it's one particular one that i have my clients use um mostly because i like the fact that it stays in that language of spending plan versus budgets but there's plenty of them out there um you can pick the one that actually you can try them all you know try not them all try a number <laughs> of them out um because you don't want to try them all um and i'm particular about one thing I like about some software is I don't want it connected directly to my bank account. Um, in my old life, I was an IT um, executive. Um, and, and so I know a lot about technology and I don't feel all that comfortable about having my software, a separate program now connected to my bank that's connected to my investments. Yeah, no, um, they need to be all separated in my mind. So my the software that i usually have people work with or if they work with some of these other ones that want to connect if they absolutely require it i wouldn't suggest that was a good option the mm -hmm. ones that are your choice you either you know export the transactions from your um from your bank or your credit union and then put it in yourself or you do it manually if you don't have that many transactions mm -hmm. is the better route to go from a security mm -hmm. standpoint okay i feel like too many holes like that opens up <laughs> many possibilities of you know, you get to one thing, then you somehow get into the other. Um, there's too much interconnection for my for my safety feelings on that and security. So, um, and I know too much. So it just makes it, yeah. just to me, it makes it simpler to separate it. And I don't want that many people or companies touching my money in different places. No, I'm good. Right. Know what they're doing. <laughs> Well, the good the good thing right now is that I'm not bringing in any money, so I don't have any transactions, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about numbers. <laughs> so you have a clean you're, slate. You're a trip. <laughs> right, you're starting from a clean slate. Be easy. Be no problem at all. You can start right now. <laughs> I love it. I love your oh. sense of humor. <laughs> So, you know, I, I might have, be looking you up, Sheila. I might be looking you yeah. up, but, but first I got to get some income to, in order to do that. <laughs> I understand. I totally understand. It's, it's one of those times right now. We're all kind of, yeah. Yeah. I'm just thrilled that I was telling Patty that my business has actually gone up. I've actually got more and more clients now, which is, I, I was surprised. That. In the beginning, things were slow because guess yeah. what? Everybody, you know, got a shock, right? Mm -hmm. And they needed yeah. to figure out where are they? Where, where is everything? Yeah. Um, and now that I think people have kind of navigated the situation in some cases, and now they're like, okay, I'm ready to get this money thing handled. Like, I want to yeah. understand where I am and how do I get where I want to go. So what, I can say, help, help, help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to say, Sheila, what would you, right now, at this point in time, what is some of the best advice you would give people right now? Some of the best things to do, as we talked about in the beginning, was expenses. 
Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found most people don't realize they have subscriptions to things that they're unaware of. Um, and because it's like a couple dollars here or a couple of dollars there. Um, and so that's the number one thing I did too, is I went through my own subscriptions to make sure I killed everything that did not need to really be there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I say, some of the stuff is automatic, so you don't necessarily know it. Right. Um, also really looking into as I said, your unnecessary expenses where they're just not required. And they're, unfortunately we end up with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, again, just because you got something here, you got something there. Um, and so that's one way, one thing to do. Another thing is that if you do own a home, another thing I would suggest is that look at your interest rate. And right now interest rates are really low. Banks are a little backed up because the number of people trying to refinance mm -hmm. is kind of high. Um, but that would be another place to look at because you could easily save yourself a couple hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. depending again on where you are in the interest rates. So mm -hmm. it's something to consider. Um, as well as even refinancing debt, if you happen to have debt, then looking at refinancing that right now, because again, interest rates are low. If you have a good credit score, then you can get, you could even get a 0% interest if you wanted to right now. Um, and, uh, but again, that's if your credit rating is good, then mm -hmm. you could possibly get even that low. Mm -hmm. So with a certain time frame, right. And, um, mm -hmm. and so those are the, those are the, probably the, things that come to my mind that are quickest things that you can look at um, mm -hmm. and um, and really kind of make a shift. Yeah, that's great. And what, and what about if you have money invested and you've lost a lot of it? Is there, I mean, I guess that depends on what you have it in, but you know, that's kind of like an issue as, as well, because I thought I would have something. I mean, after 2008, I didn't think I'd have to go through this again. But, but I have, and you know, $50,000 means a lot, you know? Um, so right now I'm trying to decide, actually I'm gonna talk with my, my advisor next week, but I'm just trying to just decide, you know, I, 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 I can't afford to lose any more money. Well, okay, so looking at the stock market, and I've had- And it's not stocks, it's basically bonds. It's basically, oh. high, it's basically high, investment, high income bonds and oh. not stock market. But I am getting an income from them. But at, right. at, at some point, I have to change that because now that I've lost, that's not going to last very much longer. I so. see. Okay, bonds. Ooh. Okay. Um, yeah. That's a little <laughs> different of a story. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a tough place to be in mostly bonds. Because I said, if you were stocks, it, it's, it's already come back up. So you could actually just yeah. exit out of some of those before the recession hit um, and put yourself in something a little safer. The, um, and again, this is not, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not giving. No, no, I understand. I understand. I'm just asking, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but given that, I've had, the thing that I would do is look at where you are right now. Just, okay, it is what it is, right? So whatever the number is right now, wherever it's left you at, and I would talk to your financial advisor about one, a couple of things. Does, does it look like you can move to something without, and you, will, you will absorb the loss the minute you get out of them. So that's, that's the key. Um, if you were in stocks, you could avoid absorbing the loss and right. just staying in it. And then, then mm -hmm. it goes back up as it went back up and you felt like, okay, I need to get out, get out. And now you haven't really lost anything. Um, but given your current circumstances, I would look at what could be, what could he move you to that could, like for bonds, you can sometimes, as I say, you're still gonna absorb the loss, but you could possibly move into something a little less. Um, risky. Yeah. And they're not that, risky though, but, they're not risky. They're not risky no, because not of- risky. It's just the value drop. So yeah. yeah. Oh, bonds, okay. Risky yeah. values drop. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. The opposite of yeah. stocks usually. So, um, and so since stable. the stocks are in the market, yeah, it just. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I know. I got out of the stocks stocks because of 2008, and I said, okay, I need something more conservative, which is you know, which is good, um, and it's been paying me an income, which that part is really good because that is helping me. Now you know, with this, now it's another story. Now I got to rethink. <laughs> In a sense, if you have the bonds, yes, the values have dropped, but you're still getting the income. But the yes. but the you can possibly roll it into another bond and another area 
So it's possible you will absorb some of the loss when you come out of it. Um, but it's unfortunate. It's one of those things of I know you have to either decide right now because everything is where it is and the interest rates are low and everything. It's a it's a messy time to yeah. pull out. Yeah, I'm finding that I'm finding that it's a lot of mess that I don't want to think about, but I, but, but I, but I have to. Yeah. You have to, but I would definitely ask um, the financial advisor a couple of different things. What other um, options you have as far as where to roll it to that would reduce or reduce your your downside, meaning reduce your your loss, if you will, as much as you can. Can it be moved into another bond? or another, well, none of the bonds are doing well, so let me not say that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Some other product. As I'm saying, I'm like, that's not accurate. There's no bonds doing well. Um, and that's because of the interest rates. So the, um, the thing I would suggest is to really come from it saying, okay, this has happened. Where can I move to now? Given the fact that I did not want to be in this position, what are my options? Um, one of the things I teach my clients is if you don't want to learn about um, investing, which I do teach them the basics of investing strategy, what are, you know, stock market and real estate market investing, I do say then look at index funds. Because if you don't want to understand the stock market or pick individual stocks or get into the process, which is a way to make a lot of, you know, can do pretty nicely better than the stock market overall. Um, if you do your homework and pick good quality companies, um, then that may be your better route. But if you don't want to do any of that, then index funds are your best bet. It gives you, you are going to still get the up and the down of the market because that's what an index fund does. But at least if you have that over an industry that you know, or an area that you know, then you'll know or have some feel, unless you have a pandemic, what is going to happen in that particular area. For instance, because I was in IT, I knew technology. So almost all the companies I invested in were technology companies because I knew that industry really, really well. And I knew when something was gonna happen even before it would show up on the stock market mm -hmm. um, because I knew what was the trends, I knew what was going on and I followed it exactly because it was the industry I was in. That's what I mean. If you don't want to do any of that, then I always suggest that you look at index funds as the, as the vehicle, because then you don't have to manage it. The fees are low and um, you don't have to know everything about um, a particular industry. But that's the, that's the payoff is that you get lower overall, you're going to get a lower return, but it's also less, you know, stress. Thank you. <laughs> Well, well, Sheila, this has been amazing. This has been such a great conversation, such a rich conversation. And I think everybody's got, you know, their, their side of things, their concerns, their, their worries. So how can people reach you? And, and what, what are some of the ways that people could, could connect with you? Well, there's a couple of, if people would love to have a conversation with me, you can always go to callwithsheila.com. And I'm happy to have a conversation with you just to chat, no, no obligation. And, and um, so I can you know, answer some of your questions. Um, you're also welcome to go to my website, which is sheilanetti.com. And on there, I have a free gift, a free guide. So it's sheilanetti.com. And it's S-H-E-I-L-A-N-E-T-T-I.com. And, um, and so thank you, Patty. She put it in the chat. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> with Sheila .com. Sheila spelled S E. Yeah, it's spelled correctly. You got it yeah. all. So um, that's a good way you can go and get on my email list there. Um, pick up the free guide, which I have, which is the top three surprising ways that women, uh, professional women, stop themselves from reaching their financial goals. That's my oh, next that's nice. free gift on that. I'm probably on the top of that list. <laughs> But thank oh you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't no, think you're as as. Dumb. I don't think you. I don't <laughs> think any of those. Be honest. Sell yourself you. short. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. 
Well, again, Sheila, thanks so much for spending so much time with us, uh, for being so generous with your time and with your information. And thanks to all of you guys that logged on and asked such great questions and had such good discussions around this. And for those of you who listened to the recording afterwards, be sure to reach out to Sheila if she can help at callwithsheila.com or sheilanetti.com. And until the next time, everybody be safe, hold on to your pennies, and uh, and let's let's be smart investing women. Take care, everyone. Um, thank you all. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.